A rainstorm is almost always something to celebrate. The precipitation keeps crops and trees alive, and afterward, everything looks fresh and clean. But severe storms, like hurricanes and tornadoes, can be incredibly dangerous. Their strong winds can shatter windows, uproot trees, and pulverize buildings. Hurricanes can bring torrential rains that cause extreme flooding. But what causes these storms? And why do tornadoes and cyclones both have a vortex of swirling air? I'm Math Dad. I'm Science Mom. And today we're learning about dangerous storms. Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you're watching from, and welcome. Today, I want to start with a question for Math Dad and for our live students in the chat. Right. What type of cloud can produce a storm? We're going to be talking about hurricanes and tornadoes, but it's also important to know what about lightning storms, just like a kind of an ordinary severe storm that might produce hail or lightning. What type of clouds? Yes, what type of cloud produces that type of storm? So the different types of clouds, we've got the stratus, the cirrus, the cumulus, so it's, got, it's a cumulus cloud. Cumulus cloud is a in the right direction, but there is a specific type of cloud, and I'm seeing a couple comments coming up now in the chat. Cumulonimbus is correct. A cumulus cloud looks white and fluffy and round, like, like a big heap of cotton, right? Mm -hmm. And if a cumulus cloud gets big enough to produce a lot of rain, then we call it a cumulonimbus cloud. And it is only cumulonimbus clouds that can produce lightning and hail and some of the more severe storm effects. Ooh. But if a cumulonimbus cloud gets really, really big, then we have a new name for it. Oh, what's a that? A supercell. And a supercell thunderstorm, a really enormous cumulus cloud, cumulonimbus cloud, that is the type of cloud that can produce tornadoes. That's a cool name, supercell. A supercell. I'm not an ordinary cell, I'm a supercell. A supercell, that's right. But before we dive into the three things that make tornadoes and some of the most common myths about tornadoes, we need to talk about what a vortex is. Because to understand tornadoes and hurricanes, you need to know a little bit about a vortex. I know what a vortex is. It's a, it's a spinny, spinny thing. It is a spinny, spinny thing. And I'm going to show you why this happens with a quick little demonstration. Oh. Wait, wait. Are we making a mess? Um, I put a rag in this bowl so that you wouldn't get splashed, Math Dad. Okay, t type into the chat, no messes, science mom, because I think that will encourage her. Tell, tell Math Dad, he'll be okay. It's only <laughs> water. There's no food covering in it even. All right. All right, if you will move that bowl back just slightly, All right. I'm going to dump both of these upside down, but one of them I'm just going to turn upside down, and the other bottle I'm going to rotate slightly and see if I can get a vortex going, and there should be a big difference. Ready? All right. One. Yeah. Two, three. Okay, they're both pouring out. This Whoa. one's empty. That one's still going. Ooh, was that one less full? They were exactly the same amount full, but this one, and I didn't do a lot of spinning, just a little bit of a spin, got a vortex going, and it emptied way faster than this one. Okay, that was cool. And that is the purpose of a vortex. It helps to move things a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. So when you have a bottle with water in it, and the water wants to drop down and air needs to get up inside the bottle, the uh, fastest way to have that happen is with a vortex. Because otherwise the bubbles are doing the glug glug thing, right? Yes, and it's very inefficient. And we can show you how inefficient it is with an even smaller hole. If you'll grab that contraption right by, right by you, Math Dad. Okay. This is a tornado tube. And if you got one of our supply kits, there's one of these inside your supply kit that you can use. So you can replicate this later. And if you don't have a supply kit, you can actually make your own by just taking a washer with about a pencil size hole in the middle, putting it in between two bottles and then duct taping it really securely around. I'd, I'd what, do it outdoors if I were you. <laughs> <laughs> Watch what happens if we turn this upside down. Our water, which has red food coloring in it to help it be more visible, is dribbling out and bubbles are going up. Oh, now they stop for a sec. There they start again for a second. This is really slow. It's gonna take a long time. <gasps> it almost started spontaneously. A spontaneous vortex. 
But if a vortex starts, some spinning starts, then it goes a lot faster. Now we have a little tornado of air in the center and the water level is dropping really rapidly. Oh, it stopped again. All right, that was I'll get cool. it started. So, so you, had, you had intended to give it a spin like that. That's a much yes. bigger vortex. I was going to give it a spin, but we actually had a tornado <laughs> form in this tornado tube without any spinning at all, because that's the most efficient way to get the water from the top to the bottom. I like that. We're going to do a contest now, Math Dad. you oh. got to keep that one. Oh. So this is your tornado tube, and mine looks a little different. Any guesses what I have right here? Kool-Aid? Nope, not Kool-Aid. If it was Kool-Aid, it would be mixing with the water. Oh, it's floating on top of the water. So what floats on top of water? It's oil. red. Red oil? This is lamp oil. And the oh. lamp oil, sometimes they dye it different colors just to, to make it look prettier when it's in lamps. So I have lamp oil on top here. And now I'm going to tip it upside down and give it a twist. And this should help you see the vortex even better. Wait, wait, so wait, so we're, we're both going to twist it? and At the same time. We're having a contest to see who can get their body to empty, not their the body, bottle. their bottle to empty the fastest. Ready? All right. On your mark. Get set. Go. All right. Whoa. Oh, yours looks so cool. The red tornado does look really cool, but I think yours is going faster. Uh, yeah, way faster. Yep. So wait, I'm... oh, that looks so neat. And it's because the, the water, the vortex is primarily pulling from the top. And since the red oil floats on top, most of the red oil is getting pulled down in first, but now it's starting to pull more of the water and some of the oil up top has stopped spinning. So eventually mine's going to stop and it's not going to empty. I'll have to swirl it again. But it does look pretty cool to see that red tornado. Okay, so I won the race, but you won the coolness. So it means we tied. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a tie on this one because that, that was really cool to watch. All right, now I got to spin it one more time to get the rest of it to go down in. And she didn't even make a mess, guys. Well, my hand is kind of oily. Oh, dude. <laughs> and he's rushing to get paper towels. Like, don't touch anything. Don't touch the computer. Oh, <laughs> close one. So a vortex is something that can help transfer heat or energy or liquid anytime that you have a difference in density, something that is more dense up top, less dense down below. The quickest way for them to trade places is with a vortex. Okay, so I, I, I've seen this before, like getting a jug, like trying to pour water or, or gasoline or other things that, yeah, if you just turn it upside down, you get that glug, 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 slow effect. But if you leave some opening for some air, to exchange places, then it's just a much smoother pour, a lot less splashing, and things go better. Um, is this the same thing that goes on like with a bathtub? It, it is very similar. If you pull the drain in a bathtub, the water will drain out a lot faster if a whirlpool starts. And a lot of times a whirlpool will start on its own. You don't even need to help it by start starting to swirl. It will happen on its own. Let me show yeah, I've you. I've definitely seen that before because in the bathtub, I don't go. I don't have to swirl it with my finger to get it. It just happens on its own. Yeah. Let me show you a rather scary vortex, which is what we're going to talk about next. Ooh. So let's look at a computer generated image of a tornado. And Math Dad, I want you to tell me, is this plausible or impossible? Could a tornado do what we're about to see? OK. Oh. And again, this is computer generated. This is not real footage. Whoa. So it just went right through the house right through the house. Could a tornado actually plow through a house and tear it all into tiny little pieces of wood and plaster? Uh, so I think, yes, it can actually tear through a house, but the way that things just kind of floated up and then slowly started spinning seemed a little off to me, but but I, tornadoes can do a lot of damage. They can. Kara says yes, Aeroskies and Erica and Yana are all saying yes. It, a powerful tornado really can do that much damage. A weak tornado, about the scale of zero, that we rate them from zero to five, a weak tornado is not going to damage a house like that. It might break a window or two, and it might maybe tear some, some shingles off the roof, but the house will be completely fine. A category five tornado actually can tear down entire buildings. Let's look at the three things needed for tornadoes to form, and then we'll talk a little bit more with some real life examples. So we're going to head to the notes, and if you have our notes, if you pull up page, oh, page 24. 24, that is where we're at. 
So to give you an idea of the scale, tornadoes can be pretty big. The largest tornado on record was almost two miles across at its base where it touched Ooh. down to earth. And if a tornado does not touch and connect from the cloud to the earth, then we don't call it our tornado. Then it's just a funnel cloud. And sometimes you might get a funnel cloud coming out of a tornado, but if it out of a, sorry, out of a supercell, but if it never touches the ground, then we don't call it a tornado. It's just a funnel cloud. Largest tornado ever was about two miles across, but compared to the size of the supercell, the tornado is pretty small. To get a tornado, you have to have a really big storm. And so here on our storm, we have, we have some pretty cool, some pretty cool things here that I want to label in really quick. In fact, Math Dad, if you can write storm direction up top. All right. So the storm is moving a certain direction. And if you have enough instability in the air where you get these updrafts of warm air and you get wind shear that will create a cyclone, then you can get a supercell that will have all these elements and a supercell with all these elements can create a tornado. So now we have a shelf cloud that's down there at the bottom, kind of sticking out there. And okay. it looks kind of like a shelf, right? It does, to totally, a shelf here. And we also have the mesocyclone and that's that spiral thing in the center, which causes the tornado. So the mesocyclone is our vortex. Okay. And last we have a rear flanking downdraft and a forward flanking downdraft. And we look at our storm direction. I bet we can guess which is which. This one's gotta be the rear and this one has to be the forward. Yes, those are our downdrafts. Because the, the tornado was headed in this direction. Yes. So our, the super cell. our mesocyclone, that big swirling vortex is taking things up and our downdrafts are pushing down and there is a huge exchange of pressure and temperature going on when a tornado forms, just like when you swirl this tornado tube and you get a vortex. So our three ingredients that we have to have, unstable air. We need to have warm, moist air on the bottom layer and then cool, dry air on top. The other thing that we need is wind shear. You have to have lower wind speeds down below toward the surface and higher wind speeds up high, or uh, you have to have wind changing direction as you change layers and go up higher in the atmosphere. So, so we're just not getting equal pressure across no. all elevations. If the wind speed is the same all the way along the underneath the cloud, then you're just gonna have wind blowing by. But if you have slow wind down here and high wind up here, then you start to get a vortex. You start to get that spinning. And that spinning air will then be lifted up and connect with the cloud. And that's what makes the mesocyclone, which then makes the tornado. And then, of course, most important, you have to have a lot of moisture. You have to have a lot of water vapor. If you don't have water vapor in big clouds, you're not going to get a tornado. That makes, makes sense. Without, without the moisture, you're not going to get the clouds. Yeah. Nope. All right. Are you ready to bust some myths? Yes. Okay. Number one myth that I hear about tornadoes is, or that I see online, is that tornadoes only occur in Kansas and areas of the Midwest. Okay. So the mi Midwest, wait, that's a myth? That's not true? That is not true. And let, let's look at a map real quick. So tornadoes do occur mostly in the Midwest. This is, each dot represents a tornado that occurred between 1950 and 2013. So this is more than 50 years of data. And if you look at the Midwest, the red and orange and yellow dots mean these are more powerful tornadoes. Do we get more tornadoes in Texas, Kansas, and all those states in the Midwest? Yes, indeed. Definitely. But every single state has some dots, right? Yeah. Okay, so they, they do happen everywhere, although this, the stronger ones are definitely there in the Midwest. Yeah. In fact, do, do, do you know about Asia and Europe, other places? Tornadoes have been recorded on every single U.S. state, every single province in Canada, every single country in the world, and every continent except for Antarctica. Whoa. There have been no tornadoes recorded in Antarctica, but every other country in the world has recorded at least one tornado. So they have occurred everywhere. But if you look at the United States, the United States gets more tornadoes than any other country in the world each year, and most of them happen in Texas. Uh-huh, but Texas is so big. It is, it's yeah. partly because it's so big, and it's also because the, the two things that cause Tornado Alley to get most of the tornadoes 
is the warm air that is wet from the Gulf of Mexico coming up and then meeting cold, dry air from Canada. And it's those two things coming together that produce these huge mesocyclones and supercell storms, and that's what causes the tornadoes. So Texas is right next to the Gulf, and it's well situated to get tornadoes. I thought it was just because they didn't have a lot of mountains. That, that helps. If there were huge mountain ranges across the Midwest, that would block oh. some of that air. It wouldn't meet as easily. But you can still get tornadoes even if you have mountains. You're just not as likely to get a big one. Makes sense. All right. Second myth that sometimes you'll hear is that when a tornado comes, the pressure drops. And that's true. Often the pressure will drop really low right before there's a tornado. And so this myth says that you should open up the windows in your house to even out the pressure, and then your house will have less damage. Because on the inside of your house is higher pressure and it would blow out the windows? That That's something that people used to think, yes, but it is not at all true. If a tornado is going to hit your house, the tornado will open your windows for you. So <laughs> you do not need to open the windows in advance. The best thing you can do is get to a storm shelter. And then the third third myth is that water will stop a tornado. So what do you think? And, and I guess I, sh I shouldn't have told you it was a myth. Yeah. Okay. Now you know. Okay. So, so water would, a, would stop a river or a lake. If a tornado is coming and there's a river or a lake, is that going to change the direction of the tornado or stop the tornado? <sighs> Nuclear missile is not going to stop that tornado, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> the the water cooler temperatures tend to help a tornado to weaken and not be as strong. But tornadoes have crossed lakes and rivers before. There have been documented cases where it just went right through. So water will not stop it. And then last but not least, some people think you will always see a tornado. Is this true or false? Wait, wait, wait. Like I don't see a tornado right now. So rephrase. Will, will you always see a tornado before it hits? Oh, before it hits. Yes. Um, like unless it comes down on top of you, right? Usually you can see tornadoes because usually they have water vapor in them and they're white or gray, just like a cloud is white or gray. But sometimes a tornado can form and not be very visible. And if a tornado is forming right on top of you, you're not going to see it. Well, so, that was that scary, the idea of this pretty invisible. You're like, huh. I, I, you just see a cow fly by. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it, it is scary. Now, usually, usually you can see tornadoes, but here's the good news. The good news is that because of the science we have, we can actually predict a tornado and send out a warning right before one forms. And these are getting more and more accurate. And the reason we can is because of radar. So using satellites, we can actually look at a storm and see what the wind currents are doing and see how much rain and hail is there. And tornadoes form when there's a mesocyclone. Remember we talked about that swirling that swirling current of air? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show that image one more time and take a look at how when the mesocyclone comes up and meets that huge supercell, it causes the storm to kind of hook and turn around the mesocyclone. And so you can actually oh, see yeah, that yeah. kind of characteristic hook. So that sign and other signals that meteorologists gather from weather in the Midwest, we have a pretty good tornado warning system. So if you hear the siren, even if you look outside and you don't see a tornado, if you get into a safe spot, you'll be all right. And most houses in the Midwest, they either have a basement or a safe room. And there's a literal safe room I want to show you from Joplin, Missouri. So first, a Category 5 tornado went through Joplin, Missouri in Whoa. 2011, and the damage was really unbelievable. Oh, that's just a street with houses on it. What or, used to be houses. What used to be Oh, yes. man. And, and here's a before and after image where they overlaid two images. And this just shows you how powerful Category 5 hurricanes, or not hurricanes, so that's tornadoes the, that's can be. That's the before and after. Yes. Part. And the houses just look like they're gone. So you might think nothing could survive. But here is a bank vault. The bank is gone. <laughs> <laughs> but the safe deposit vault is still there because it was made out of reinforced concrete. So the money's safe. No, no worries. <laughs> that, oh, man. If you, if you have a safe house, a room that is reinforced and doesn't have windows, if you have a safe room in your house, or if you have a basement, you can survive a tornado even if it's a Category 5 tornado, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah. But it's important, yeah, it's important to make sure that if you do live in an area that is in Tornado Alley, listen for those tornado warnings. And then if a tornado siren sounds, even if the sky looks calm, 
get into your safe house or your basement and make sure that you you write it out there and stay safe. So it makes me think, boy, we need to make sure we have a family plan. Like, right, how would we deal with an emergency like this? So, yeah, if you, if you don't know what your family plan is, talk it over with your family. Yeah, yeah, find out. So that that's our quick overview of tornadoes. We'll talk more about them in just a minute. But first, I want to make sure that we cover hurricanes because hurricanes are very different. A tornado happens under a supercell. But a hurricane is a storm system, and it is much, much larger. And the Ooh. best term for hurricanes and typhoons is actually a cyclone. Let's go to the next page in the notes, page 25. Okay. And I'm seeing some wonderful, wonderful comments in the chat about record-breaking tornadoes and people who have actually experienced tornadoes before. All right, let's move on and we'll talk about hurricanes real quick. Okay. So for a hurricane or a cyclone, and those two words mean the same thing. A tropical cyclone is the scientific name for this type of a storm. And if they're from the Atlantic Ocean, we tend to call them hurricanes. If they form in the Pacific, we tend to call them typhoons. But those three words are for the same thing. So, wait, wait. so, so if, if we were doing the Venn diagram, you're saying the big one would be just cyclones? Yes, tropical cyclone is a uh, circular rotating storm that has a low pressure area at the center and is really large. And is it just cut in half? Half of them are hurricanes, half of them are typhoons, or is it an even bigger class? Um, no, typhoons and hurricanes are both different types of tropical cyclones. Okay. So we yep, just different, different names for... So some, sometimes we call them hurricanes, sometimes we call them typhoons. If you live in Asia, typhoon is what you're going to hear people say. If you live in the United States, people call them hurricanes. And for these to form, you have to have warm ocean waters. A hurricane cannot form over land. It can only form over the ocean. And the difference with, between hurricanes and tornado formation is that for a hurricane, you actually need to have fairly calm winds. The winds need to be fairly gentle so that there can be enough time for the storm system to form. If the winds are really fast and abrupt, then different pieces of the the hurricane are going to split off and it's not ever going to form a hurricane. Well, that's kind of counterintuitive. If you want a hurricane, you've got to have a really long calm period. Yeah, fairly yeah. fairly calm. Yeah, but yeah. the wind can't you can't have a lot of wind shear or a lot of really violent wind. And then of course, moisture, just like with tornadoes, we have to have really moist air. And when I say that hurricanes are larger than tornadoes, like this cannot be overstated. A hurricane <laughs> is so much bigger than a tornado. The record holding tornado for size for the largest um, spout at the part at the bottom is about two miles. And the average hurricane is hundreds of miles wide. In oh, fact, wow. hurricanes are so big, they can actually cause tornadoes. There have been oh. several several large hurricanes where parts of the rain bands here, these these huge cumulonimbus clouds, have actually formed their own little tornadoes before. That doesn't happen with every hurricane, but it has happened before. Now, what's going on here in this hurricane? The real purpose, scientifically, the real purpose of the hurricane is to transfer heat. You have warm air from the ocean that is rising up, and that warm air is going out, up into the cool atmosphere, and cooler air is coming down. So there's an exchange of pressure and heat that happens with a hurricane, and a hurricane really does a good job of taking heat from the ocean and moving it up into the atmosphere. So are you saying that this funnel, or this vortex, is just caused naturally by the transfer of the warm air up and the cold air down? Exactly. And it happens, it happens differently whether you're north or south of the equator. And this is pretty cool. If you are to the north of the equator, naturally, that hurricane is going to rotate in a counterclockwise direction. But if you are south of the equator, the hurricanes, and usually it's called a typhoon if it's over the Pacific Ocean, it's going to rotate clockwise. Hmm. They're both tropical cyclones. They're both formed over warm ocean water, and they're a huge storm system that develops a natural rotation. Why does one rotate one direction and one the other? It's a mystery. It's because of the Coriolis effect, something that we'll be learning more about on Wednesday. Oh, well, I'm excited. I want to check real fast, and because I know our moderators have been gathering some questions, real fast, I'm going to check and see some 
some questions, and then we'll go on to our where in the world mystery and the quiz questions. So are there any good things or advantages of tornadoes? Zachary Marin asks, and that's a great question. So I would say advantages of tornadoes is that by studying them, we can better understand weather because there are still some mysteries about exactly how tornadoes form. We don't really know what happens on the exact inside of a tornado because we haven't successfully measured it yet. So some scientists think that there's a low pressure zone at the very inside of a tornado. Other scientists think there's not. So one good thing is that tornadoes allow us to learn more about weather, but most of the things about tornadoes are bad. They're pretty damaging. Ooh, Winston asks about what layer these tornadoes and, and hurricanes are happening in. Great question, Winston. It is all in the troposphere. All of this is happening in the troposphere in that lowest layer of the atmosphere. Once we get up into the stratosphere, the air is too cold and too thin for these type of clouds to form. And yep, good question. Kelly asks, why is the sky discolored when a tornado is gone? So when, and I'm, I'm curious to know a little more about this question. If you want, you can email me later. But when a tornado is gone, you still have that huge supercell thunderstorm around. And the supercell thunderstorms ah. are really enormous. And also they can pick up debris from the tornado that can cause them to look a little bit different. If you look at this radar image that we showed earlier, all of that red, you don't normally see red on radar. That's actually because of the debris that the tornado had picked up. Oh. That, that's what causes that's what caused that that red there on the radar map. So the tornado can actually bring enough dust up into the cloud that the cloud might look different because of dust. That was a good question. Um, what about the wind speeds on these? Ooh, and I'm, I'm seeing a couple good questions about, you know, what would, what's worse, a tornado or a hurricane? <laughs> it all depends. A tornado is going to have the possibility of much faster wind speeds than a hurricane. If you look at like category five hurricane versus category five tornado, the maximum wind speed in a tornado will be higher. And the average tornado has higher wind speeds than the average hurricane. But a Category 5 hurricane and a Category 5 tornado can both tear apart buildings and do a lot of damage. And with a hurricane, it's so much bigger that it's going to cause a lot more damage than a single tornado. Because a single tornado, you know, might take out part of a town, but a hurricane can take out multiple cities. Yeah. But the advantage with hurricanes is that we have a really long warning time. We know days in advance that a hurricane is coming, where with a tornado, you might have a couple hours, you might only have a few minutes. So in general, if you ask me which one I would rather experience, I'd probably say the hurricane. But if the hurricane's big enough, it could make a tornado and then I might get both. I, I don't know, <laughs> you guys, I don't know. Hopefully neither. So it seems like with hurricanes, often the damage is more from flooding. Like it's like picking up the ocean and dumping it on land. And that, that can be problematic because land wasn't built for that. No, that's true. One more real interesting question that came in. What would happen if there were no, to no tornadoes for a year? The United States actually gets around 1,000 tornadoes a year, and that's the most of any country in the world because of that nice um, warm Gulf air from the Gulf of Mexico coming up and meeting the cold air from Canada. If there were no tornadoes for a whole entire year, that would mean that there would have to be fewer um, large cumulonimbus thunderstorms. And so that might mean that there would be a big drought. I don't Ooh. know. But I don't think anyone would complain if there were no tornadoes because they, they tend to be pretty damaging. <laughs> They're really destructive. I remember seeing pictures of like pieces of straw that had been embedded inside like a windshield of a car. Like how could something go that fast? Because a piece of straw is not, it's not strong at all. And yeah, kind of crazy to imagine the, the speed of these winds. It is. Tornadoes can do incredible things. They can strip the bark completely off of trees but leave the trees standing. So you have a standing tree that has no bark on it and no leaves. Incredible things can happen. We will, I, I, I see lots of great questions coming in. We'll see if we can get back to them, but I want to make sure that we don't run out of time for our where in the world mystery. So it's time for the where in the world mystery, then our quiz questions. Uh -huh. And then if we have time, we'll do more Q and A. All right. Oh, that is the wrong. Oh no, math dad, I put the wrong one in. Uh oh. So quick, go to page 30 of the notes okay. and we'll read you off the clue and see if you can guess it. So on page 30 of our notes, we have a where in the world mystery page. And today our mystery is the built by the Mayans in Yucatan, 
1,500 years ago and famous for the Temple of Warriors and the Great Ball Court. Mm. So, Math Dad, what is this? Okay. Where in the world is I this? I honestly have no idea of a name on this. Okay. Yucatan. Oh, okay. the Mayan civilization. Ah, boy, this, so you, is, this is tough. I mean, I, I I can scan through the pictures and say which one of these looks the most Mayan. So be thinking Central America. Ooh, you got it right. That, that's got to be the one. That is the one. Do you oh, know what the name is? No, no, no idea. What is that? That is Chichen Itza. Chichen Itza. It is in Mexico, and it was built by the, an ancient civilization called the Mayan. And I want to give you a, just a, a feel for how large it is. So this is um, stock footage an aerial shot of a drone coming down and you can see the people down there. See how small they are. Oh yeah. It was an enormous complex, a city really built more than a thousand years ago and it was abandoned eventually and pretty much all covered up by jungle. Oh wow. And then here's one more, one more video shot just showing you the scale. Look how large. Can you imagine they didn't have heavy equipment? back then they would have no. had to have carried every rock there it, it's pretty incredible that that ancient people built such impressive structures and now it is time for quiz questions Whoa. so test yourself see how much you learned if you are participating live go to itempool.com slash science mom slash live and if you're watching the replay don't forget that on our website you can participate in these polls too All so right. our first question is what type of cloud can form a tornado Ooh, is it a supercell, a stratonimbus cloud, a cumulus, or a cirrus cloud? Ooh. Last week we learned about different types of clouds, and on your notes you'll see a little chart that shows you what altitude different types of clouds form at and which ones produce rain. But which of those can form a tornado? And I saw a couple good questions in the chat about how long tornadoes can last, and it all depends. Most tornadoes don't last too long just a few minutes, but the longest one I think was almost a half hour. It, it really depends. There's a lot of variability. Well, that's another big difference though between a hurricane and a tornado. Is the hurricane's gonna last for days, days. and... Well, in, in any one location, you know, you might only experience okay. it for, for a day, but yeah. yeah, much, much bigger. All right. Supercell is correct. Unbeatable science kids, got yeah. it. Yeah, okay, that, that one. Of course they were gonna get that. Will they get... So this next question, a large storm system with low pressure at the center, which rotates in a spiral pattern is called a, and so select all that apply. But I, I would love it if most people selected the most correct one, because one of these is most correct. Tropical okay. cyclone, hurricane, typhoon, tornado. Ooh. Which one? And we're getting, we're getting Ooh, beat up with the bars. Ah, the bars. Those hurt. No, <laughs> they don't hurt. Bring on the answers. Ooh. Okay, so all four are getting answers. Pickle Obsessed asked a great question about tornadoes that I'm gonna answer real fast okay. as I'm ducking from these bars. Can you have more than one tornado form in the same place? Yes. In fact, the the current record for the, the largest tornado, it was actually a tornado system where this huge storm cloud spawned three or four tornadoes. And there's footage of three of them touching down at the same time. Also, that's like a super duper cell. Yes. All right, I'm gonna finish and reveal. And I marked the first three answers correct. They are all correct. And tropical cyclone tide, that's the one that's most correct. So a hurricane and a tropical cyclone and a typhoon, those are three words that mean the same thing. And if you hear people talking about typhoons in Asia, a typhoon is a hurricane, which is a tropical cyclone. But tropical cyclone in, in the is... In the Pacific, they're usually yes. calling them typhoons. And in the Atlantic, a hurricane. Tropical cyclone is the more accurate or scientific term for that type of storm. All right. N nicely done, guys. Oh, but wait, wait. Why, why was... So tornado wasn't quite as accurate because it's not such a Tor large storm. We don't know if a tornado has a low pressure zone in the center. Mm -hmm. No one's successfully measured the inside of a tornado before, at least to my knowledge. Okay. So on this one, I want you to select each false statement. So only, mm -hmm. only select it if it's false. So we've got the formation of hurricanes requires warm, moist air. Tornadoes have been recorded on every continent except Antarctica. Kansas holds the record for the most tornadoes. 
and hurricanes can form tornadoes, but tornadoes cannot form hurricanes. So only select the false statements. Mm -hmm. And Matt, that didn't tell you how many are false. I this didn't. one's kind of a tricky one. No. So this is the one where you're they, hoping to stump them, I think. Yeah, you know, they, they, they were, they're doing all right up until now. But now the, the tough questions come and they crumble. They they can't be stumped, Matt. <laughs> we shall see, science mom. All right. Got our votes in. I'm going to close the poll. They said Kansas holds the record for the most tornadoes. And that is false. It's Texas. Texas has more tornadoes each year than any other state in the United States on average. So not nicely done. You, you got the answer right by selecting the false statement. And so yep. the, the others were all true. The so others are all true. So a hurricane can form a tornado. Some of those clouds that make up a hurricane are large enough to actually produce a tornado. But a tornado can never make a hurricane. A hurricane is going to be hundreds of thousands of times larger than a tornado. Oh, wow. And tornadoes have been recorded on every single continent except for Antarctica. Could you have a tornado on Antarctica? I don't think so. Because you have to have warm, moist air. And when I say warm, mm. I, it has to be at least above 60 degrees, I think. Antarctica does not get that warm. No, no, it does not. So I, I don't think there could be, but who knows? Okay. Where is heat transferred during a hurricane? Is the heat going from the ocean to the atmosphere or from the atmosphere to the ocean? Because there definitely is a heat transfer and that's why we see a spiral vortex form. That's the most efficient way to get that heat transferred. I also thought I might stump them on this one, but um, one, one, one of are. those bars is really large and the other bar is not so large. Hmm. All right, we'll call it a draw. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's a draw. I think that the science kids are claiming victory on this one, Math Dad. All right. They say that the heat is going from the ocean up to the atmosphere. That is correct. Nice job, you guys. So the, But the funnel itself was the cold air going down and the warm air was on the outer part. Was that correct? That, that's a good way to think about it, yeah. Hmm. All right, and our final question. Opening windows will equalize the pressure between the outside and the inside of a building and will reduce damage from a tornado. So you should always open the windows if there's a tornado coming. Is that true or false? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I sense. 60, 72, 87 to 5, 95 to 5. I sense a <laughs> defeat dance coming, Math Dad. They totally got this one and knocked these answers out of the park. It is 100% false. If a tornado is coming, you should never open up your windows, waste time opening up the windows. You should immediately get to wherever your shelter place is, whether that is a safe room or a basement. Immediately take cover if you hear a tornado siren. Don't bother opening windows. All right. Do I have to do a defeat dance? You have dance? to do a defeat dance. Wah, wah, wah. Good right. job, right. science kids. <laughs> <laughs> the chicken floss makes makes uh, it you again. <laughs> all right, that's okay. I'm saving it. I'm saving up all the good stuff for Friday when we do our quiz show. Friday we do have a quiz show, which is going to be super fun. Uh, that's when they'll meet their demise. I don't know about that. <laughs> all right, I'm going to answer three more questions and then we are out of time. So, how do people know if a tornado is coming? A question from Kendall. Great question. Mm. And there are a couple different things that are the main predictors. One is radar and satellite imagery. So by looking at the shape of the cloud and the size of the cloud, scientists are able to predict whether the conditions are right. And then the other is from data on the ground, especially the wind speed and the barometric pressure. There is often a pressure drop right before a tornado comes. And if you have agreement between sensors on the ground and the satellite data, then an alarm will go out, a siren usually in most of the Midwest cities, they have a tornado warning siren to tell everyone take cover. Good question. And I'm sure, I'm sure glad that we can predict them because I think a lot of lives are saved but people just have enough warning so they can get to safety. Definitely. Good question from, from Quinn. Why is rain and hail on the east side of the tornado in our drawing? So our drawing in the notes is a little oversimplified. On both locations where you have the downdraft, you can have rain happening, but it's that, that forward flanking downdraft tends to be the one where you have the most, the most rain. 
but it it depends. There is there is variability with with these storms and how they work. All right. And last but not least, we have some birthday shout outs. Ooh. So a special happy birthday to Jess Hoffman, who had a birthday yesterday. Happy birthday, Jess. Happy birthday to Leaf from Utah, who has a birthday today. We hope you have a wonderful birthday, Leaf. Let's go, Leaf. Happy birthday, Jacob from South Carolina, who turns eight today. <gasps> Big eight. Turn Happy on its birthday. side and it's infinity. That's right. Happy birthday to Olivia McLeod, who turns 10 today. And a very happy birthday to Jake, who turned 10 yesterday. We hope you had a great birthday yesterday, Good Jake. Job, Leaf, Jacob, Olivia, and Jake. Work hard, grow smart, and we will see you Wednesday. And on Wednesday, we're going to be learning more about why hurricanes don't typically cross the equator and why they turn a different direction in the north versus the south.